Hi, welcome to Circular Vision. My name is Misha, and today I'm here with Joyce Huang. Uh, Ms. Huang is an expert in architecture with a strong vision for a sustainable future. She's on a mission to save animal habitats through design activism in a rapidly industrializing world and build environments that would allow animals and humans to cooperatively coexist. She uses a creative approach to promote projects such as life support and backcloud. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about your personal story and how you found your uh, passion for habitecture? Yeah, sure. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so, I mean, I get this question a lot. I, um, was, I, I, I wasn't somebody who grew up like say camping or, um, you know, out in nature all the time and so on. I actually grew up in a um, kind of suburban, <clears throat> sorry, suburban part of uh, California near Los Angeles in Orange County. And I think um, one of the things that happened a lot when I was younger was just, you know, because everything was so manicured in, you know, our backyard and in the suburbs, like whenever I would see something sort of like out of the ordinary, like, you know, a bird's nest being built in a kind of irregular place or something like that, it would really um, just kind of pique my curiosity. And um, there was just so many kind of instances, instances of that. Um, also, then later on in graduate school, when I went to Princeton, I took a class um, at that point with um, Catherine Ingraham, who is an architectural theorist, um, and it was on um, architecture and biology. And so that was like the first time where I was starting to kind of like think more specifically about animals. And in fact, in my graduate thesis, I, I did a zoo as a as a thesis project, not necessarily to, you know, to advocate for zoos, but to be somewhat critical of what, what zoos are in terms of, you know, um, you know, keeping animals in captivity, but also at the same time having this kind of mission of educating the public, which is obviously a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, coming to Buffalo, uh, where I live now, um, there's just a very different sort of environment. There's a lot of wildlife in the city um, because there are kind of under maintained areas and so on. And it's a it's really eye opening just to kind of see a different kind of landscape. So I don't know. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that that's also some something I thought about when I was little. I remember, uh, I spent my early life in Russia, and oh. I would build. Um, I remember we have projects in our kindergarten that we build bird houses out of like wood or hard cardboard boxes and stuff like that, and that always made me think like. I mean, obviously, I was about like five years old back then, but um, that, you know, we always, we build houses for people. We spend so much um, technology and there's so much advancement and like all kinds of, all, all kinds of projects and uh, technologies, but never anything for animals, even though we coexist mm -hmm. with them. So yeah. so, yeah, it's really interesting how society functions like that. Yeah, really absolutely. Excited, but your uh, life support project actually um, with the installation of a 400 year old tree, which provided habitat for animals. And could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so that was a project that I developed in collaboration with an ecologist named Darren LaRue, who um, uh, is based in Canberra, Australia, and Mitchell Whitelaw, who is a data visualization designer also based in Canberra and he's at ANU Australian National University um, and what was really fascinating about that project it, it, a lot of it actually stemmed from actually from an academic conference that the three of us were at together um, and we sort of realized that we had a lot of mutual interests and I was specifically drawn to Darren's research um, on basically the ecological value of old trees so if you just like take any any old tree um, you know, it has so much more kind of like biodiversity um, in that tree than say like just a random piece of lumber or, you know, something, some, you know, some kind of manufactured material. And he was doing research on just, you know, just how every part of the tree from like the bark to the, you know, cavities to all that stuff, how all that provides ecological value. But um, because of the condition in Australia where trees are basically in, in residential neighborhoods, there, a lot of the trees are actually being slated for uh, for um, removal because they because they get so big and the branches are really heavy and then when they fall they kind of you know damage neighboring property so they have this situation where, where all these trees are being taken down and it's not really it's not like anyone's fault necessarily it's not like if I if I had a house in that neighborhood I wouldn't necessarily you know I don't want to have a branch falling on my property either yeah but um, mm -hmm. 
but you know so so it's it's not like you can't like blame the the residents for wanting to take them down but at the same time you have all these like very large trees that are providing ecological value that are being stripped away and so this was darren's research and um mitchell actually um the data visualization designer actually wanted to bring us all together to a project and so that project basically stemmed out of the this kind of collaborative um relationship between the three of us um i went to australia for a summer to to do a project and it turned out that there was a tree that was going to be removed um so we ended up just saying okay well let's use this tree as like the kind of you know the the material for the project and um yeah and uh and that was yeah that was the way the project was born um wow. yeah <laughs> well, i'm glad you liked that project yeah no it, it's really yeah, interesting yeah. because we tend to you know whenever working on something to uh, get a lot of new materials purchase things you know but here it's almost like upcycling something that uh and giving it a new life i don't know i thought that was that part was um uh, really inspiring yeah it's so interesting because like i mean i so in the us um it's it seems like you know when you see trees being removed a lot of times that they get like kind of they get made into mulch right it's like you just see them all getting ground up Mm -hmm. In Australia, what I have understood is that they get cut in like into small pieces and made into firewood. So they're still using the material, but but the the kind of I guess the um the point that somebody like Darren's trying to make is like instead of you know making it into something like you know dimensional lumber or something else, could like how do we kind of take advantage of the you know the whole the whole tree itself, which is already doing a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, because that's a, even even less processing and it gets incorporated into something that yeah. supports more than just people but yeah so i mean well a lot of the like industrialization and obviously overconsumption the world is facing a big crisis of biodiversity and extinction so it puts like a great amount of responsibility on the new generation so what is your view and experience of the challenges we face and how can we work to preserve some biodiversity um, I, I think a challenge that we all face, um, is, is how the world is essentially run, <clears throat> excuse me, run on capital. Um, um, if everything is seen as a kind of system of exchanges, like where something has value to something else and it can be exchanged for something, it's like, I, I don't know. I, I think there's some, I think there's something that is just sort of, that makes it really difficult to kind of like see the kind of bigger picture maybe um like if we if i think one of the problems in terms of ecology is is um on the one hand you know of course we want to like live um environmentally and um you know with a conscience toward toward um you know sustainability but if we're always looking toward the toward ecology as a form of service like what can it do for us as humans then we're sort of like missing the bigger picture, right? Like then, then it's like if an animal or plant doesn't serve us directly, what use does it have? And we don't really realize things till it's too late, um, which is why we have all these crises. It's like it's like it's only until um, you know until there's there's an animal that is like about to be extinct or that something is endangered that people will step up and start to kind of like you know try to do something about it. But by that point, it's like very late. Yeah. Um, so so yeah so i think trying to figure out a way to kind of live in the world in this world of exchanges and values without necessarily um relying on cap you know the way on capitalism as we understand it now um i don't know i think that's i think that's a big challenge um yeah yeah definitely uh that's actually was it's funny you brought this up i was just having a conversation with my dad about this yesterday how <laughs> <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything we do is kind of very conditional and an exchange of favors so we never well not never but it's really rare to encounter things like unconditional appreciation and just doing things for the sake of kindness like we start judging success in terms of money in terms of right, um, right. And, and yeah and isn't I, I actually didn't get it our um completely from your email but are you an architect also or or no you're not an architecture student or anything no it was actually my dream for a while when I was little I might have to revive that later but 
<laughs> no, I wasn't, I wasn't a hundred percent sure because I think like, well, one of the problems with architecture and for young people in architecture is that, um, that success as you're saying, um, a lot, I mean, I think things are changing now, but there's a thing, um, in our profession where the success of a firm is, is basically based on how many square feet they build or how much money, how much, how, how much money they've, they've, um, they've amassed or not amassed, but, but yeah, like what, how much square footage or, or what their construction costs are. Yeah. And there's gotta be some other way to evaluate what success is, um, or even like to even using the word success is like a little bit difficult too. Like, what do we mean by that? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Cause then it adds this kind of duality to it. And when you do something purely out of, you know, um, to contribute something, it becomes seen as, um, comes looked down at. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. And I also wanted to mention, so obviously, you know, growing up sooner or later, my generation will have to face a lot of these, um, like both environmental and societal issues. So how would you suggest mm -hmm. teen, as teens and, and adults, can we help to protect wildlife and, uh, build a better community? Hmm. I think there has to be a, I guess like a, a couple things come to mind. One is that I think there needs to be a kind of fundamental like attitude shift toward the way that we as humans understand and think of ourselves in the world and, and the way we relate with what we think of as nature. Um, I think there's often this the kind of separation that we will draw between ourselves and everything else on the planet. Um, and so trying to kind of develop an attitude shift is important in making anything happen. Otherwise, you know, there isn't going to be any, any kind of motivation to change. Um, but yeah, but I think, um, I don't know, in terms of, of generational, uh, I guess that you were talking about your generation. One thing I, I was kind of thinking about the other day was, um, like, um, how one might be able to, um, I don't know, just like, wait, I, I don't know if this makes sense, but like, how ways, how are ways that people are educated? I feel like, um, like, I wonder if, you know, if it might make, if it might be more somehow um, productive or interesting or valuable or whatever for, for students these days to, to learn through processes where they have to encounter uncertainty. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, um, because oftentimes when you're when you're in school and certainly in architecture school, there's there's this kind of demand for like, what do we need to do? Like, tell us what to do. Like, these are the steps. Um, but it's pretty rare that if you, like, if you have, if you give a student like something that's very nebulous and uncertain and there's no real clear kind of assignment, it's like everybody kind of freezes up and it's just like, we don't understand what to do, you know? And so sometimes I even think like, if there's assignments that are just even less certain, I wonder if that would help pre pre prepare people, you know, in future generations more yeah. because they, at the end of the day, they're going to have to, that's what they're dealing with. They're, it's like, we don't know what all the issues are. They're still kind of emerging, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. At the, I mean, at the end of the day, like the world is uncertain. And when you get out there, it's like you have to make creative choices by your, on your own and decisions. And I feel like that's what I personally find hard for myself, too, because like growing up, you know, I get a homework assignment. I do my homework assignment, but it's rare that <laughs> I have to come up with my own homework assignment. Right. Yeah, that would be interesting is for students to actually have to come up with their own homework assignment. Like if <laughs> for students to like if their assignment is like research and find something that you think is pressing and come up with an assignment about it, that would be like really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And yeah, it's it also, I find it interesting how you touched on um, how we separate ourselves from the environment that we live in, because I was studying, um, I, I was studying Buddhism a couple of years ago. I'm actually still studying it. And the whole mm. idea of, um, and when I, when I was getting into meditation, this, there's this whole idea of oneness and um, kind of breaking the boundary between your, your body and your inner thoughts and uh, the outward world, such as like sounds mm -hmm. and um, things you see and kind of recognizing it as a single working mechanism mm. and like that kind of resonated with what you said I feel like in a way like it, there's this kind of connection between everything yeah no that's great that's great that you're you're meditating I actually 
I, I haven't done that, but I think um, there are, there are activities that I do that sometimes make me feel that way. Like if I, I go running a lot yeah, and um, being out just kind of running and sort of like not even really thinking about anything too hard. I really feel like kind of super connected with the world somehow. Yeah. 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 Running, running is, is meditation. Running is active meditation. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I believe, I, I believe in that strongly. <laughs> okay, cool. So Yeah. <laughs> And also, um, I wanted to talk about how in your field of, um, in your field notes on design activism for Places Journal, you have touched on history and social justice as subjects directly intertwined with the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. How can we as a society implement the nuanced local perspectives and uh, historical context into our art and pursuit for a sustainable future? Yeah, so, um, so just to explain like, a little bit of what you were um what you alluded to it's um i don't think that everybody um at least even architecture students but a lot there i don't think that everybody necessarily understands like that there is a kind of very strong link between um you know between social justice and um and um and climate change so and that there is a kind of intersectional condition that we really have to kind of think about and, and address um, there's a lot of, you know, I would say disproportionately, there are neighborhoods in, you know, in cities where, um, where things are under maintained, where we see these conditions as, you know, um, as, as urban blight, we don't, they don't have parks, they don't have resources, they don't have trees. Um, there's like, oftentimes you see, you know, like poorer neighborhoods having say, just like less trees, less tree cover, more urban heat island. So there's this, this link. Um, there's also a link with things like you know food sources like there's a number in buffalo there's like you know the the under-resourced neighborhoods here don't have you know fresh produce they don't have i mean they do but there's only like one um you know grocery store in this entire area and in, in this entire neighborhood in buffalo that actually has like access to fresh food um and otherwise people have to kind of get in their cars and go somewhere else they can't like you know and go to a different part of the city to get groceries so um, anyway, so there there are links there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, but one of the things I think is really um, critical um, that I'm trying to sort of still figure out is and try to, I'm still thinking about it and still trying to figure out how how architects and designers and, and urban planners can and I guess people can address this is that um, oftentimes in cities we see a relationship or humans I would say you know humans in cities. We'll see a relationship between um, under maintained areas, which oftentimes are full of, you know, wildlife and actually very biodiverse, but they'll see these kinds of spaces as spaces of blight. Um, and whereas they'll see something like a manicured lawn as like the desirable condition, right? Like you want to yeah. see this mowed lawn as like a desirable condition, but actually in, in a lot of cases, the mowed lawn is like the least biodiverse place. A lawn is not, it looks green, but it actually doesn't really do much for biodiversity. You can't have, you don't really have insects living in there really. I mean, there are some, they're all living in the ground and the soil, but the grass itself is not host for anything. It doesn't attract pollinators. It doesn't serve, you know, so there's, so in the meanwhile, you have like um, areas where there's like, you know, unmaintained or, or wild grasses um, or different types of plants growing like pollinators and stuff. And because there's a kind of inconsistency or it looks a different way or it looks wild, um, it's seen as, you know, undesirable. So my, um, so in terms of this kind of question of, um, of social justice, like I, I would be interested in, um, you know, as an architect trying to think about how to kind of, again, like change the perception of what these spaces might feel like, like, why do we all need to aspire toward having a, you know, a blanket lawn. Um, and there's a lot of people thinking about this already, of course, this is not a new, a new thing, but um, like, how do we change the, um, I guess the kind of vision of what we think a desirable neighborhood might look like, or what a desirable front yard might look like, it does, you know, it could look, it could be something a bit more unruly. It could be something that, you know, hosts animals and plants that, you know, it, it I think, a lot of times people will associate things like the presence of mice and rats and other animals like squirrels with like someplace being like, you know, terrible or something, but it's like, yeah, yeah. Having a rat inside your house is terrible, but a rat outside is like not a problem, right? It's like yeah, yeah. a rat going down well, a rat hole live. outside, <laughs> right? Um, so anyway, so that's, 
so anyway that those are a few thoughts there <laughs> yeah no definitely like um it, it, it's it, it's funny i'll be reading the news and you know people will be shocked like oh my god there's a shark like because i live in florida so there's gonna be like, oh okay gonna be news like oh my god there's a shark near the coast of florida and i'm like yeah like that's where they live you know <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> like that's their house why are we uh so shocked about the same of like raccoons and uh, like all the little animals too you know um mm -hmm. it's their home before it is ours at the end of the day so absolutely so, what yeah. part of florida are you in um i'm in south florida um a little bit a little bit north of miami so oh okay yeah so suburban suburban area mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i mean there's there's a lot of things like um i i think i saw isn't there like in near fort lauderdale lauderdale isn't there something like a turtle like turtle crossing not turtle crossing but there's there's like an area where like there's a lot of turtles like crossing as they kind of move across the road to to the water during breeding season yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that or and yeah, so a lot of time oh sorry go ahead Oh no! Thing I, I was just gonna say that they even set up the lights for them at night. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's that's excellent. I mean, it's like that shows care. At least I I think there's so many so there's so many situations where you know an animal crossing the road does, is more of a nuisance to humans than them thinking about the life of animals. When actually there's like having setting up infrastructures for animals across the road. It seems like really simple, but it it's really important. Um, yeah. No. Absolutely. Not not any less important that is setting up infrastructure for people, right? Yeah. So no, definitely. And there's a there's a lot of um interesting things actually here in Florida. There's a lot of natural reserves nearby, and we have um, you know, this place actually right by my house where uh they rescue turtles, and um, it's a, it's just like a really sweet place. I I, I love going there sometimes, but <laughs> yeah, it's just on the side now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. But yeah, also to switch topics a little bit, I also would like to ask you about the um, wildfires in Canada and the air quality in New York. So, I mean, we're all seeing the images of what's going on. So uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, that's like a, um, I mean, I'm I'm in Buffalo, which is about um, eight hours drive or six hours drive from New York City. So it's not as bad here as it is in, in New York City, um, but it's still bad enough where the air is, you know, unhealthy. Um, but in, in New York city, things were looking pretty apocalyptic. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I just think it's like, I mean, it's just a, it's just an indication of like how climate change is affecting us so quickly. Like, um, like, I don't think, I don't think if you asked us, you know, like five years ago, would we see this kind of wildfire, like at this level in, on the East coast? Um, I don't think anybody would. I don't know. I don't think people would expect it. And this is indicative of every other thing that's happening with climate change. Like everything is happening so quickly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the other thing that I think is kind of um, the other thought I have is I, I'm actually from California, where there are a lot of wildfires because of how dry it is. And that's that's a condition that we we just uh, tend to associate with places like California. But now we really see, you know, and oftentimes like people in other places of the country will kind of say, oh, well, that's that's that problems that or that's that region's problem. That's not our problem. But now with this, we can see how everything is really connected. It's not just like, OK, that if you don't if you're trying to avoid this type of issue or wildfires that you move somewhere else. Now this is it's like every place is affected. Yeah. Um, it's not going to I don't think it's going to get any better the way things are going unless we really change things. Yeah, I mean, we all live in a single world world, so all of the the waste and the contributions that we make, they reflect on us somehow. So yeah, I find it really sad, but um, hopefully it will be a bit of a wake up call for some people and uh, some, some change is going to happen, but you know, we'll see. Yeah. And you also, it's also what, one thing that, that causes uh, worry um, as well as like, you know, the thing they've been telling us this whole time with with the fires, like, okay, air is hazardous. Everybody stay inside. You know, all outdoor activities are canceled. Everyone go. It's like there's there the solution is just to basically remove yourself from the environment. It's like by further removing yourself, you're saving yourself. But what about the rest of the environment? Like, I I'm, I also wonder. 
I wonder about, you know, how, how do, how are all animals actually going to respond to this? Like they're all, they're, you know, it's like they're outside, they're breathing in this air. Is like, how is this affecting them? There's, we're not actually going to know because people aren't probably, you know, I'm not completely sure, but no one is saying, okay, we're going to sample all the animals in New York City, you know, and figure out like how this, how this, um, how the wildfires have impacted them. Mm -hmm. um, at least I don't see that as a study going on quite yet, but maybe it should be. Um, I, we just don't really know what, what's going to happen, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely really scary. And, um, but yeah, we'll see. Also wanted to ask you something about um, uh, animals as well. So as a human species, it's, uh, I mean, it's clear that we're kind of, have a dominion over the natural wor wor world. So do you believe it is our responsibility to learn more about animals around us and um, to protect and conserve them? How would we um, maybe maybe implement some kind of educational program or some, something along those lines? Yeah, um, I, I definitely think it's our responsibility to protect the earth um, and the earth, including animals and plants, flora and fauna. Um, I think, I mean, clearly, I, I definitely think education is a good um, pathway to that. Um, and it's really great that, you know, young people like you are asking all these questions. Um, I think education about animal conservation has been going on for a long time, though. Um, like I, I, you know, what I was saying about zoos earlier on is, you know, a lot of a lot of kids in, um, you know, urban areas or suburban areas aren't really exposed to animals that much unless they go to a zoo, right? Or unless they see a kind of bird in the backyard or something, but they're not, it's not like they're regularly seeing different types of animals. And oftentimes it's like only the zoo where, um, where you can kind of see, you know, see different species and kind of understand how they move and stuff. Um, so education, but at the same, so there's, you know, the project of animal conservation is really important. Um, even if it means, you know, having animals in captivity. But I, I guess one question I, I have, um, which I, I haven't answered at all, is like, how do we start to kind of work on a different way of thinking about animal conservation that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the classroom, you know, like the classroom as we know it. Um, mm -hmm. I think things like different meat, like technologies are helping with that, like, you know, things like social media, things like um, AI, or not AI, sorry, augmented reality. Um, you know, those might be the ways where we can sort of use technology to try to understand and learn more about animals without actually having to kind of capture them or be in the same space as them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I mean, but it is, I, yeah, it's definitely, definitely important. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I agree since uh, we're being provided constantly a lot of new tools, really powerful tools with the advancements of internet, like you mentioned augmented reality, it would be um, wasteful not to use them as some kind of way to promote the betterment of um, society and uh, the natural world in general. So I love that idea. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing so much wisdom, so many interesting things and uh, coming out to the, um, to the YouTube channel. Sure, thank you for inviting me. It was great chatting with you. Thank you, it was, it was great talking to you too.